Our lives are laid out on a road of bumps, turns, struggles, and more. How do we respond? How do we endure adversity for learning and growth? I'm Aubrey Johnson, and we'll explore these questions and more on The Roads of Rediscovery. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Roads of Rediscovery. I'm your host, Aubrey Johnson. The Road to Rediscovery is about reflecting on life lessons to learn and grow from them, and of course, take it to the next level and help others who are struggling through dark times. Now, as you know, on The Road to Rediscovery, we are very passionate about delivering quality content that is of value to you and your personal growth. If you like what you hear, please feel free to visit roadtorediscovery.com slash donate. That's road, the number two, rediscovery.com slash donate. We'll give you a shout out in a future episode. And as always, there is no obligation. We are truly, truly grateful for your listenership. You know, the term personal growth can have so many different different meanings, right? I mean, depending on who you ask. Uh, if someone says, I'm seeking personal growth, right? Uh, what can that mean, right? Spiritually, emotionally, health and self-care? Well, what if we threw in financial, financial personal growth? Is there such a thing? You bet there is. In his own personal crusade to growth, my special guest has combined his life lessons learned with his accounting practice to create a new approach to personal finance. In fact, he has a special gift for combining his passions with purpose. From his love of personal finances to satire and humor to travel, he helps others create a healthy relationship with money in his book, The Money Nerve, Navigating the Emotions of Money. He's also ventured into stand-up comedy. And get this, he's the CFO of the world-famous comedy store. We're going to dive into the money, the travel, the humor of it all. Let's welcome Mr. Bob Wheeler to the show. Bob, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you here. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here, Aubrey. <laughs> All right. We're excited to have you, as you can hear. <laughs> I, I love I love the audience. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, you know what? Let's just go ahead and start out the gate, if you don't mind. Um, can you tell us point blank, what is the secret sauce for effectively having a humorous comedic approach to such a serious topic as finances? <laughs> Uh, we all have to take life a little less serious, right? I mean, yeah. there's there's enough heaviness in the world, so we got to be able to laugh a little, laugh at ourselves, and uh, yeah, not take it too serious. Yeah, yeah, no, very true, very true. Um, I, I, someone once told me, um, uh, don't take what you do seriously, but don't take yourself as serious, right? Yeah, uh, it's easy to get caught up in, uh, in 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 all those things and beating yourself up over you know mishaps. I mean, we're not perfect, right? For sure. All right, fantastic. So, um, want to talk about the? I want to break this down into two part conversation. Right, the first part is um, the uh, emotional side, right of 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 money and finances and, and and that sort of thing and then i want to i want to talk about your book and the comedic approach that um that that you use if if that's okay yeah absolutely. all right so um when it comes to having a relationship with money um should i don't know over the years and and maybe it's just me but um money has been I've always been told to have a cerebral approach to money, right? Um, just, just very um, factual, very uh, almost businesslike, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 so um, I don't know. To me, there's a kind of a a bit of an indif indifference when it comes to that 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 type of connection, right? Um, um, obviously, you know, don't let it consume you. But um, when it comes to being familiar with the meanings such as an um, impulse buying, right. And emotional purchases and that sort of thing. Um, obviously those are not cerebral approaches to finances, right. but uh, in a lot of cases, it, 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 based on what you buy, it's pretty obvious to someone, you know, um, outside looking in that it's, 
an impulse buy or it's emotional. Um, but what are some examples of financial decision making influenced by emotions that we may not be familiar with or may happen subconsciously? So there's so many different examples. Um, I want to give you an example, though, that a lot of people don't think about mm -hmm. when it comes to money and emotions. Uh, go out with a large group of people, go out with extended family members to dinner and then split the bill. And you watch everybody. I just recently had a bunch of family together. We had this mm -hmm. amazing dinner. And mm -hmm. then it was a meltdown when the bill came. Because oh, really? some, some people are like, I didn't buy a drink. I'm not going to pay for anything extra. Somebody yeah. else wants to make sure they got exactly the right amount, but maybe they didn't calculate the tax. Uh, mm -hmm. Other people are like, just whatever, split it equally. Right? Yeah. All yeah. these and all this family history is going on with, oh, so and so is going to be cheap again. Yeah, and yeah. It's insane to watch. I have a um, several friends that are quite successful in television. A guy was telling me he went out to dinner with a bunch of his friends from the hood, and <laughs> he had made a big. They invited him to go to this big steakhouse, and at the yeah. end they said, "Well, dude, you're paying. You're the rich dude now." And he what? looked at everybody and said, "I'm not paying." <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's it's like that's just a one example of where. We're making decision making. Do I order what I normally order because we're right. going to split the bill or right. because they said they were going to pay? Maybe I better not drink. Like yeah. our behavior changes over a meal, um, whether we're paying or somebody else is going to pay or somebody else wants to pay the whole bill so they don't have to have the conversation about who's right. going to pay the bill. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but even besides that, there are so many ways we have fear of having success. So if I if I'm too successful, mm -hmm. I might have to be in the spotlight. People right. might ask me for money. I might have to set a boundary. Uh, uh, I know people that have switched jobs because the new the higher paying job involved speaking uh, at staff meetings. Oh, right. I don't want to talk. Uh, yeah. Boom, I'm out. Uh, people. <laughs> are afraid they're going to be discovered that they're a fraud. So many people, this imposter syndrome is so real. It is real. Absolutely. So many people that will say, I don't deserve this. And if mm -hmm. people knew the truth, mm -hmm. forget about the fact that I have experience that I went to, uh, that I got an education, right. uh, like none of that matters if people only knew. So there's this whole deserving, not deserving. Uh, am I going to have enough to retire? Yeah. Uh, like there's just fear fear around money drives so many decisions yeah. put money in the stock market don't put money in the stock market right right yeah <laughs> you know it, it reminds me uh you remind me of of, of, of a few things that uh that comes to mind uh, one is um there was this commercial i saw where i can't remember what it was for i think it was for banking decisions when it comes to cryptocurrency or this type of thing and it was a guy like in his living room on a phone and uh, I guess he's checking his balance or something. And then he says, I'm a millionaire. And next thing you, you see him at work, like throwing everything out. And then uh, then he's in a club buying drinks. And then he looks at his phone. And he says, I'm not a millionaire. Then everyone leaves, <laughs> you know. Right. So the volatility. Right. And the uh, and, and the fear of that volatility uh, seems to, to drive a lot of the emotional decisions behind money as well, to your point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing right now. There's a lot of people that I, I have several clients that went and said to me, Bob, I have found the magic investment in this crypto thing or I'm going to be mining. And right. I was like, all right, I'm talking to them today and they're saying, <laughs> yeah, it didn't work out. Yeah, it didn't yeah. work out. But yeah. it felt so real. And so positive. Sure. When they parted with their money. Yeah, no, and uh, and 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 it is real when they part with their money, right? I mean, uh, yeah, uh, that's a uh, that's that's a gutsy call, I, I think, you know. Um, and everyone has their opinions about about that. So, um, thank you for sharing that insight of um, of of you know when people split the bill, um, family goes out to eat, and that sort of thing. Oh, another thing that made me that that made me think uh, of as well. Bob is um, uh, growing up. I had a lot of um, you know friends um, my age. Uh, let's say I'm in my early to mid twenties, you know, years ago, and um, and and they were of the mindset 
of uh, two things. Number one, if if one friend asks the other friend to go get something to eat or out to eat, then it's implied that they're footing the bill. And I'm thinking, why is that? You know, now if it's like a date type of thing, then that's different, right? But amongst yeah. friends. And then the second thing is, um, it was it was it was a habit. You know, I've never done it, but my friends did it as a habit. Where um, if 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 you know going in that someone is treating, then they that that person being treated would get a bigger item off the menu or a more expensive item. Instead of instead of getting rib tips, they would get um, uh, fillet or something like right. that. You know. And, uh, and, 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 and can you explain a little bit about some of those, uh, emotional, um, uh, drivings, um, when it comes to finances? Well, I think what happens is all of us pick up things when we're kids, whether it's yeah. from our parents, from our culturally, religiously, yeah. like we get these messages. Mm -hmm. And so then we go in with, oh, this is my criteria. This is my story around money. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if somebody else asks me out for lunch, then they have to pay. That's a rule. And maybe mom told me that rule. Don't ever let any, if somebody asks you out, it's their job. So we've had some rules drilled into our head. Okay. And, you know, and then, oh, if you're a good person, you'll do this. Mm -hmm, Bad mm -hmm. people do this. So if, you know, so around saying that the person being treated gets to get the bigger item, that's again, that's just a nod to the agreement of, um, they're the treated person, they get a special benefit. Um, mm. But again, that that's an agreement that not everybody else necessarily has. Right. You know, I, I remember going to college and finding out all these rules. Yeah. Everybody was like, where, where'd you read the rules? I'm like, no, 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 this is like the law. You know, you can't have a second bowl of cereal if you don't drink the milk out of the first bowl. 100%. Like, couldn't agree more. I grew like, up that way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I had a big family. That's the rule. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I went, to, I remember I bought this five pound box of chocolate candies uh, yeah. for my girlfriend in college and her family started eating the whole box. And I'm like, you get one piece. A right. Day. Like, Hey, time out, you know, Ooh, yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. Right. So we all have these rules and then some of us agree to them. And then some people will say, well, no, that's not the rule. And then you go, oh, okay, I'm on board or I'm not. Mm -hmm. And then we start making that as if it's the truth. I see. I see. So it sounds like, um, let's say over the course of the last 50 years um, or 60 years, uh, sounds like there are some uh, generational behaviors mm -hmm. um, that have survived, if you will, um, from generation to generation based on the environment we grew up in and yeah. uh, what was considered the norm in that environment when it came to finances. Yeah. And then um, I guess there are some newly adapted behaviors when it comes to emotional, um, um, emotional driving financial decisions, say over the past 60 years, has there been any new, any new emotional like connections with finances say today that maybe wasn't in existence 20, 30, 40 years ago? Well, I think one thing that's new is, the ability to instantly be a millionaire, like you said, uh, yeah. right? All of a sudden I have millions of dollars or I have a few mm -hmm. dollars um, and it's very volatile, but there are a lot of younger people think that, oh, money just comes in. Um, yeah. You know, the number one thing for kids to be is an influencer. Yeah. Um, and because money is just, you go out and you do some videos and money just pours in. Um, <laughs> that's the thought at least. <laughs> that's the thought. And interestingly enough, with a lot of the younger generation, my mm -hmm. family included, uh, what do you mean we have to pay rent? Do you know how stressful that is to have to think about paying rent? <laughs> you want me to go out, and pay my, you want to take me off the family plan and not pay my phone bill? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. Like, and yet they want to go out and take over the whole world, but they don't really want to actually have to pay for anything because that's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, it's, it's a little hard for me to process sometimes when I hear some of the stuff that comes out of people and, you know, I can't go in my day, 
but it is interesting how there's a real shift from I've had several younger family members saying, of course, we should get an allowance from the government. Everybody should get an allowance. Hmm. Um, yeah, OK, but who's going to pay for that? Well, you know, right. Yeah. Man, somebody. Um, somebody. Yeah. There's, a dis there's a disconnect in how everything should be paid. Look, in a perfect world, that'd be great if everything was paid for for everybody. But then sure. we'd all be living in the same house. Yeah. Uh, nobody gets an extra bedroom. Nobody gets yep. the pool. Right then yeah. we're going to make that equal. And I think the ability to make money, to be able to have nice things or to be able to ha take vacations mm -hmm. um, is determined by our willingness to work. Not that we should all just be given what, you know, an equal amount. And then we all just sit around going, okay, cool. Yeah. You know what? Metaphorically speaking, what you just explained there, Bob, at least in my, in my view, the way I interpret it is um, it's the exact same as, the uh family picking up the bill analogy <laughs> right. right so yeah. uh like you said i mean you know if 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 everyone had their bills paid for and everything then you know we no one would get an extra bedroom we live in the same type houses same size no different and then you know some people may earn more than others but they get the same so right in some cases you know you you make less you're getting more in other cases people who are making more they're getting less than they're just due based off their merit and so forth right so footing the bill with the family <laughs> i equate that by saying um some people got had more to eat had a few more drinks but they're paying the same. So, so it's a little less for them. Other people right. just had like, I don't know, water in a salad and they're paying more because it's all equal. Right. Um, there's a lot of debate behind that, you know? Yeah. And yeah, yeah, there really is. Um, I wanted to ask you about, and this came up when I was um, thinking about our conversation last night, mm -hmm. there's a lot of topics that are considered taboo in mm -hmm. society, right? And I am of the belief that uh, finances to some degree is among a taboo topic. You know, yeah. we don't normally, you know, usually share what we make with our coworkers or right. we don't tell our, you know, friends how much we have in the bank and, and stuff right. like that, right? So um, is it, my question is based on the chicken and the egg theory, right? I mean, are our emotions over money influenced by these taboos or are the taboos influenced by our emotions and, 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 and in what way? Well, that's an interesting question. I, even though I think they both feed each other, I think my guess would be, and obviously I can't go back a couple hundred years right, or more. Right. I have a feeling that, Somebody might have had an emotion and said, oh, my God, I'm really nervous about this. Mm -hmm. Or if my business partners find out about this and the, everybody goes, Shh, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. like, we mm -hmm. can't let anybody know. Right. I mean, yeah. if, if even if you go back to like medieval times, if you believe movies or even what you read, people were presenting. Like this is a presentation of how my life is supposed to theoretically look, even though behind the scenes, we're propping things up, we're moving things around. So it's good, right? We're yeah. staging. Yeah. And so I think for a long time, maybe, maybe post caveman, uh, we've been presenting, we've been staging things. It's just now with social media and things, it's more immediate. I'm having this amazing vacation. I'm having these amazing things. But I, I think um, early on, and I know wealthy clients and, and friends who can't let anybody know that their money is dried up because they have to have a certain presentation with the people that they went to college with mm -hmm. or the neighborhood that they live in. And, and so I do think certainly there's a taboo to talk about it. Um, you know, if you're in the Midwest, that's just shameful to uh, flaunt your money or talk about it. You just, <laughs> you know, you, you, you politely put that money aside, but never mention it. Yeah. Um, and so it's definitely taboo. You know, people say don't talk about uh, sex or politics, but they'd rather talk about sex or politics than talk about money yes. because we don't run around going, Oh my God, guys, I just filed a bankruptcy and my credit card debt, it's through the roof. 
Yeah. I'm probably going to have my car taken away from me tomorrow. We don't share that stuff. No. And now, interestingly, younger generations share tend to more share their salaries. Wait, mm -hmm. you're making this, you're making that. But mm -hmm. that's a generational thing that's newer. Um, but we're not running around sharing our debt. And when I when I when I do workshops. What's interesting is I'll separate the men and the women because gender also plays a role right. um, in, in, in our finances. <clears throat> and, mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that all men do this and all women do this. Your parents might have thought women can do anything and men can't do anything, right? It, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's individualized, but gender plays a role. And when the men get separated, often there's a bit of posturing initially, like, what kind of car do you drive? What kind yeah. of job do you have? <laughs> right. When they and and what what they find is when we actually let our guard down and we do some sharing at the end of the workshop, people, the men will come back and say, I've never actually sat with a group of men and talked about my finances in, in a way that I wasn't having to posture. Really? And it's like, wow, we do so much of that. Yeah. Yeah, we we certainly do. And and, and, and it's not authentic when, no. when when that happens. Right. 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 Oh my God. But we have to be perceived, but we have to be perceived as a winner. Yep. We got to like, we got to be the, we got to be the breadwinner, the ultimate breadwinner. A lot of no. pressure there. Yeah, that is a lot of pressure. And, and another element that I think you alluded to Bob was, um, and, and I've, I've struggled with this in my earlier years. Um, when you get to be a certain age, you, you kind of let it go, which I think I, I like to think I did. But in my earlier years, 20s and 30s, my whole mindset was, well, how do I measure up? Right. How do right. I measure up to this guy? This guy's my age. Uh, am I in the same socioeconomic uh, place in life as this guy? Uh, am I ahead? Am I behind? You know, where do I stack up with this guy? Um like you said, what do you drive? What kind of job you have, right? Absolutely. And, you know, the interesting thing, what we don't ask, and they don't even ask this in school much is, mm -hmm. are you happy? <laughs> are right. you fulfilled? <laughs> yeah, such a simple question, you know? Yeah. But I think people are afraid to answer in a lot yeah. of cases. Yeah. Well, I think they are, and I think it's vulnerable. I think yes, it's it vulnerable is. to say, I'm happy or I want to have an impact or I want to change the world or I want to be seen. Yeah. I yeah. want to, I want to feel like I matter. Yeah. That's really vulnerable to sit there and say, yeah, I'm just me, but I want to make a difference and I want to be seen and I want to be valued. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I also believe that it's, uh, it's, it's also, um, it's also scary for a lot of people to sure. answer that question because when they, not everyone, but when some people stop and actually think, wait a minute, am I happy? You know, they, 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 if they, you know, that, that, that takes, that question leads to an introspective uh, 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 approach, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's like, okay, let me think, am I happy? And there may be a realization, you know, where uh, maybe not as happy as I could be or as I want to be. And then that opens Pan that opens Pandora's box, right? For, okay, why am I not happy? What can I do to be happy? And then the list goes on and on from there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, what I would say to that is for people out there that are saying, well, I, you know, I don't know if I'm, if I'm happy. Well, the thing is, if you have to start answering those questions and you want a different outcome, you might actually have to take some responsibility. 100% right. accountability and, for sure. You, and and I think for a lot of people, that's a painful process, right? Mm -hmm. We have to feel the grief. We have to feel the grief of I'm not where I wanted to be. And I might be partially responsible for that. Yes. That's taking that hard look in the mirror and, uh, and, and, and also holding yourself accountable, which takes a degree of self-awareness, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. And so I think that kind of segues uh, into financial therapy. Um, yeah. Can you share with us a little bit about financial therapy? I think you alluded to uh, some of it um, earlier in, in, in the answers you've given. 
But uh, how can the listeners understand what financial therapy is? Everyone's in a different place financially. Everyone is in a different place when it comes to their life, right? Um, new family starting out or a family planning their retirement because they're less than five years out from, you know, retiring. Um, everyone's in a different place. So um, what is therapy for those different types of uh, family uh, circumstances? Yeah. So financial therapy, you know, just like being in marriage counseling or uh, being in therapy around your, your parents or your kids yeah. or whatever it might be, money is a relationship. Mm -hmm. And so our relationship whether it's good or bad, whether we have these negative beliefs, whether we have self-sabotaging thoughts, um, to start to understand if I believe money is scarce or money is evil or money is dangerous or whatever I might believe, if I don't start to understand my relationship with money, I can't really change it. So I, I've got to name it and bring it into consciousness so that I can see that, oh, I have a belief like so, for example, when I was younger, uh, my parents got divorced. My mom, whether she was joking or not. Um, so this is not blame here, but this right, is no. right. My mom yeah. said, um, you need to be really successful. So me and your siblings can have the life we deserve. Now I have four siblings. So I'm mm -hmm. thinking. I have to be successful so I can pay for five other people without any choice. I think I'll stay broke for a while. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then I sabotaged anything that would come money. I could make money. It, money would come to me and I would have it gone in five minutes so that if my mom said, could I borrow some money? Ah, I don't have any. Mm, I'm not yeah. lying. Right. And yeah. so what I actually had to do was learn to say, yeah, actually, I do have the money. It's not available at the moment. And so unfortunately, you're going to have to find another source. Like right. I needed to be able to draw a boundary and yeah. be able to have a have a, a confident no um, right. without feeling shame or guilt. And so right. starting to understand what we've learned about money, what we believe about money, what we believe about our own self-worth, all of those things come into play when we're doing financial therapy, when we're actually starting to realize, oh, I have a belief that it happens for everybody else but me. Right, right. You know, this happens a lot. People will inherit you know, 10,000 bucks, 50,000 bucks, a hundred thousand yeah. bucks. Mm -hmm. They'll immediately start. Oh, let me pay off all my debts. Let me pay. Like, let's get the money back out of the bank account, back to the level we're used to. Yeah. Right. right. How about just let it sit there and say, hello. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm for. You know, Yeah. let us Come sit there, sit there a while. Let's talk. Yeah. But yeah. Most people will get rid of it because it's uncomfortable. Mm. It's beyond their comfort zone. I see. I see. Man, interesting, you know, and 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 those people, some, most of them may not even be aware of that, right? Most because, are, most are not aware. Okay, because they're so focused on um, uh, reducing or eliminating debt, right? Or right. buying the latest uh, laptop or 80, 86 inch widescreen or whatever, you know. Absolutely. And there's nothing yeah. wrong with paying down debt, right? No, no, but no. No. to immediately, the minute the bank gets the money that you immediately like, let it sit yeah. for, it's not due for 20 days. Let it sit yeah. for 20 days. Look okay. at it, get comfortable. <laughs> but most of us aren't comfortable with that extra money. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's amazing. That's an incredible insight that I'm glad you shared with the listeners because, you know, um, like I said, everyone's in, in a different financial situation. And, and I, I'm sure there are listeners who have, who are currently either have gone through or currently going through some very, very um, seemingly insurmountable financial struggles. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and with your financial therapy, with, um, with, with your book, I'm sure that, you know, um, they can, they can see their way to the other side. Uh, you know, they can definitely see their way. You can, I mean, because it can happen to any of us, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And listen, I can tell you, there was a time when I was comfortable with not overdrawn, right? That was like, yeah. if my bank balance was not overdrawn, it was a good day, you wow. know? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and so we've all had it. I've had places. I've, I've had, had it too, actually. Yeah. I have been at the bottom of the bottom and my bottom of the bottom is still not as bad as it could be. 
in in some places in the world where yeah. at least I had access to food and shelter, but yes. things were really, really tight and incredibly stressful on my health, on yeah. my mental health. Yeah. Um, and then I got more comfortable. Oh, okay. I'm allowed to have money and I can say no to this and I can say no to that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm allowed to have even more. So it took me a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's doable. Mm -hmm. You have to be focused. You have to know what the goal is. You have to know what your mission is. Right. You have to set intentions and then you have to be a conscious and intentional about the way you handle your money, but it's definitely yeah. doable. It is definitely doable. And, uh, and, and I guess when you get to a certain point with those you interact with, to your point earlier, um, sometimes you may need to set some boundaries, right? Because there's these unwarranted expectations when, right. say, a family member sees that, oh, you got a promotion and you're making this much more. Uh, or, hey, you won the lottery. So that means, you know, um, when it's my birthday, I'm going to get a great gift or Christmas and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so, so yeah, setting those boundaries, it sounds like something, uh, that people recovering and thriving financially really need to, to be aware of and have on their radar. Yeah. And you know, money is a great manipulator. Yeah. If you behave a certain way, I'll give you some money. And, you know, I grew up, my grandparents, my parents to a degree, they didn't have a lot, but money mm. was, you know, I'll, I'll pay you this if you behave nicely or yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Oh, you right. did this. I'm going to punish you. And yeah. I didn't realize I would use money to throw it at a problem. So instead of having a conversation, I would just throw money at it. Oh, there's mm -hmm. money. I don't need to have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that, I guess that, that has uh, some, some other long-term impacts. Uh, I would, I would imagine um, when it comes to the relationship with that person. Well, sure. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, I'll, I'll out myself on this. I finally was at a point where, you know, for a while I told my mom, look, I can't help you. Yeah. Um, and she, she struggled and I was like, that's your struggle. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point I did feel like, you know what, I'm willing to help and I can do it uh, without feeling an obligation. Like I yeah. want to do it because I want to do it. Right. And right. so I had paid for this trip. Uh, it was a holiday and all the family was there. And I was sort of being a jerk. You know, my mom was like, oh, I want to use the car. And I'm like, well, you can't use the car. I paid for the car and I don't want you taking the car. And so she turned to me and thankfully she turned to me and she said, so let me get this straight. Now that you pay the bills, you get to call all the shots and I'm not entitled to actually do anything other than what you want. And I was like, oh, wow. Ooh. I was punishing her for yeah. some childhood stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was just using my benevolence mm -hmm. as a way to go, well, of course, I'm so benevolent, so I get to do whatever I want. And in reality, I was manipulating the situation to actually punish her um, and was really unconscious of it. So I'm glad wow. that I got called to task. Yes. Uh, but it was sort of a painful, it was a very painful moment when I had to look at myself and see that I was actually not being really an in integrity. Wow. You know, uh, and, and as painful a moment as, as that was, Bob, and, and as you explain it, I, I can almost feel <laughs> the levity of that moment. Um, it's 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 also a revelation, right? Um, it's yeah. a revelation. And to, 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 to realize that your punishment of her was emotionally driven from from decades ago when you were right. younger, right? right? So yeah, that's, uh, that's, man, that's tremendous. Um, I, I want to thank you for sharing that insight uh, at the risk of say your vulnerability, your transparency, sharing with the listeners um, because, you know, I, I, I'm sure it happens in, in many other family situations. Yeah. And it, look, it's not fun doing self-evaluation. No, it is. It, it's painful, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I would rather. I've come to learn that I'd rather just be honest and say this is who I am. Yeah, warts and all, and I'm gonna make mistakes, and I'm gonna make more mistakes in the future, and I'm gonna hurt people's feelings, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do things that I'm gonna have to repair. But I'd rather show up and say this is me than yeah. try to spend all this time and energy trying to present, trying mm -hmm. to stage an amazing experience. Right. Uh, because I'm not always, I, I'm going to fail. 
I, I'm I'm not going to always pass the mustard. So yeah, yeah. Um, so many of us are are like that, you know. And and hey, that's that's how we learn. That's how we grow, right? So um, let's let's talk about the 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 humorous approach, right? Yeah. Um, love to chat about. Um, give us a little background into your fascination with comedy and how you like uh, started in to stand up comedy, and then I guess your inspiration behind combining that with uh, your accounting uh, practice. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, as a kid, I was little, so mm -hmm. you have to either be fast or funny or both. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know? So I was fast and I was funny because uh, if I could make people laugh and then run really quickly, I, uh, I didn't get beat up. Um, <laughs> right. So, I, you know, so humor early on was a way for me to connect with the world. Mm -hmm. um, it was. And if people were to have met me years ago, I was very I was quiet. Um, mm -hmm. I could make people laugh. But other than that, I was I could make myself invisible. Yeah. Um, and uh, hence going into accounting because it was a place where I could just deal with numbers and not people. Um, right. Because for a long time, I had a lot of trauma around uh, being out in public, mm -hmm. sh speaking my voice. Uh, mm -hmm. Just I would tremble. You know, I remember I was in a when I first started doing personal work and I was in this group of people and they're like, just say your name and where you're from. And I'm like, oh, my name is. You know? <laughs> and they were like, yeah. what is going on? And I'm like, I'm terrified. Yeah. If I'm not sitting at my desk in my power seat, mm -hmm. I'm terrified. If I had more than two clients in a room, I'm terrified. I was. Yeah. And, and so comedy was a way for me to have a voice be seen. Um, I didn't have to be logical. I just had to make you laugh. Yeah. So you couldn't say, well, that's stupid. Okay. It's stupid, but I made you laugh. Right? <laughs> right. So I didn't have to be. And, and so I was also able to express my anger and frustration at the world or at people. And then just say, Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Right. right. Because I had to be the good guy. Yeah. Um, that was my role. And so for me, comedy was a way to get to express myself, have fun, yeah. And and be able to go. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, I see. So later on, though, what's been great is comedy is a great way to disarm people. Um, mm -hmm. So if I'm talking to somebody about some financial habits, they continue to mm -hmm. repeat. Mm -hmm. I might share a funny story about somebody else and they'll go, oh, that's oh, that's me. Um, mm. Oh, oh, I didn't even notice. I was just telling a funny story. Oh, I guess it is sort of similar. So yeah. it's, a, it's a way to keep people's defenses down and actually let them take in the message. And so I, I you know, I, there are certain things I don't joke about. Like if, right. if a client is traumatized about what they're going to owe, I'm not going to go, you owe a million dollars. Right. Uh, no. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I know people yeah. are very serious about their money. Sure, um, sure. But I do find ways to lighten it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that they know I'm on their side yes, and that they know I see the seriousness of it, but that I also want to bring some, um, lightness to it because like, if we just focus on like, Oh my God, Oh my God. Like it's not a very enjoyable life ride. No, it's not. It really isn't. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's validity in healthy nervousness yeah um but uh paralyzing debilitating nervousness over finances yeah. can um really be um really be a bad ride right and un an unideal less in less enjoyable ride to your point um man yeah so uh it's uh, do your clients do you do you find or see that your clients um begin to adapt a comedic approach or a humorous light lighter approach to finances um, as you're working with them with their own finances? I think so. I mean, for, for sure with me, they're a lot more uh, light and playful about right. their situation. Even when they've done something that they regret, they'll go, you're going to, you're going to, this is going to be part of your material. Right. Yeah, you know, they'll, yeah. Like they'll, they'll laugh at themselves and say, ah, I know I shouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, call me to task and then let's figure out a way. And I'm like, all right. Um, yeah, I do. I think I really try to let people know, look, I'm on your side and yeah. I want to create a safe space. Yes. Uh, which includes humor. Um, I know some CPAs 
that will take their clients to task, will shame them into a behavior. And I'm not interested in shaming people into a behavior. I'd love to encourage them to do something differently. Right. And I will support that. Um, but I don't want them to do it out of shame or to make Bob feel good that they checked a box. I want them to do yeah. it because it actually makes them feel better. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, otherwise, it's just a forced behavior change, right? And yeah. I don't know. And in, in, in what I've learned over the years, a forced behavior change almost never is sustainable, you know? Um, no. no. it's And there are some high-profile folks out there that they love to money shame. And I just, yeah. like, okay, maybe you shouldn't have bought another pair of shoes, but why what does it make you feel when you do it like let's get into why you're doing it instead of yeah. just that's bad let's yeah. and is there something else that could fill that void right right, and right. It's like that's what i'm interested in yeah that's substance right there yeah that is substance and shame is more you know like a shame on you you know you shouldn't have done that is is so so superficial right i mean it, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't address the root, I guess, is what I'm getting at here. That's right. Absolutely. Shame. Yeah. And there's enough shame going on in the world already. And we've done enough, enough self-shaming. I'm yeah. like, I'm looking for ways to create a, a non-shaming space mm -hmm. and uh, to really just welcome in what's true for you. Um, you know, I have, and this has actually happened on more than one occasion. This has happened a few times where I've worked with somebody who um, experienced a suicide Mm -hmm. Um, and they were taking on all the guilt, uh, because it was their fault as a parent or their fault as a, as a spouse. And so they've decided I'm not going to enjoy the rest of my life, or I'm going to punish myself because I did this to my children because right. I, um, and, and the guilt and shame they're carrying around, around a major mm -hmm. life event that, that they may or may not have had of any control over. Right. Right. And, and then they're taking themselves out. Oh, I'm going to live, but I'm going to pay. I'm going to poison myself. And, it's poison. And to let them be free and let them know it's okay to actually be alive and you don't have to continue apologizing. Yes. Um, like to see somebody like let go of that and, yeah. and, and, and get embraced in a workshop where everybody's like, you're lovable and we want to be with you. And, like that man, that sucks. And I'm sorry you went through that grief. Yeah. And I yeah. can't even imagine the pain. Yeah. And I want your life from here on out to be a celebration. Mm. I tell you, for someone who has gone through all that time with shame, with guilt, with beating themselves up, to hear that from someone who is uh who truly cares and uh and, and is truly compassionate. Um yeah. Talk about a relief, yeah, a huge weight off their shoulders. I mean, for you to see something like that has got to be very, very um, satisfying and pleasing, you know, for them. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's look in those exchanges, there's a lot of tears, there's a lot sure. of love, there's sure. and there's laughter. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's there is so much shame, there's so much blame. Um, you know, I, I've done workshops where had a situation where somebody was like, you know, parents promised to pay for an education, promised all these things, and then none of it happened. Right. right. And so there was all this rage uh, at the parents for their failures. And in a role play, I was able to step in and, and be the parents and just look at them and say, oh my God, we had the best of intentions. We totally dropped right. the ball. Right. We're, we're so embarrassed. We had, so, mm -hmm. and this person was able to, they went, Whoa, I did not expect that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it was so um, cathartic for them, but mm -hmm. it also gave them another perspective. They were so busy blaming and being angry yeah. that when they heard full accountability, full apology, yep. Sorry for the impact, like took ownership. The pain, yeah. They, we're like, oh my God, mm -hmm. oh my God, my parents are just human too. Right. And because we're all human. Mm -hmm. And to be able though, and I think that's there's power in taking ownership. Oh. Like, I have I done some things? Absolutely. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. It sucks. Yeah. 
but man, is it freeing to say, yeah, I did that. I'm sorry. And, uh, I'm going to do better. Yes. Yes. It's very freeing to say that there's power behind that because, um, you are admitting that you own this and, and instead of trying to suppress it, right? I mean, yeah. when you suppress it and suppress it for so long, you know, mind over matter, it, 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 it starts to eat away at you, you know? Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of power and, um, and, uh, um, revelation, re you know, uh, relief in, uh, in taking ownership in things. So, so, so Bob, let's, let's, uh, talk about your book, The Money Nerve. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm sure based on what we've chatted about so far, there has been, um, several, uh, anecdotes and insights that you've shared that's in the book. Um, um, what, what other, um, give, give us one or two examples of some other, um, anecdotes that, um, you know, that the reader or listeners can expect to see in the book? So a couple of things that I, to me, that are really important is being aware of what we say. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we're unconscious of what we say. And I hear this all the time. I'm broke. I'm broke. I'm broke. A client will tell me <laughs> yeah. how broke they are. I'm like, you're broke. You just went to Spain. You've got yeah. two rental properties. You, okay. Maybe cash flow is tight, but you're not broke. So let's change that story. Yes. Right. So that's a really important piece. Listening to the story. I need a new phone. Now, I want a new phone. Right. I, I want to take another trip across the sea, whatever it is. Yeah. But really starting to get clear about what is a want and what is uh, a need. Yeah. And just really listening to uh, what we say. I want to make lots of money, but I'm so afraid of it. Okay. Let's make those coexist. I want lots of money and I'm learning to handle my money differently because it has scared me in the past. So I want to yeah. bridge, I want to bridge a new truth with the old truth or the current truth mm -hmm. and really shift what we say. And you can ask people to hold you accountable mm -hmm. um, or just listen to yourself for a week or two of all the stories that you speak yeah. um, that really uh, aren't really true. They yeah. feel good. They feel good to say. Well, um, yeah, because, uh, you know, it's your story, right? right. And, yeah. Love my story. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels good to say, uh, but uh, it sounds like um, what you're suggesting is, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, some degree of um, appropriately reframing the narrative. Absolutely. Right? So, exactly. Reframing the narrative. Okay. Absolutely. Gotcha. That's so important. So mm -hmm. you got to be aware of what you're saying before you can reframe it, right? Yes. You gotta, and so really paying attention to that. Uh, the other thing that's a real important thing to me that I talk about in the book, and I talk about a lot of different things and I take people yeah. through a process, right. um, but um, um, honest budgeting, you know, one of the things that I'll say when I'm in a workshop and I also say this in the book, but if you're spending money, if you have a shopping addiction, if you have an alcohol addiction, right. Um, I'm not judging the addiction. No, but if I'm going to help you budget, I need to know how much you're spending in alcohol or candy or fancy shoes, whatever it is. Again, I'm not judging it, no, but I need to account for it. That's right. I just need to account for it. Yep. Now, because of that, sometimes I do see people shift the way mm -hmm. they spend their money and people mm -hmm. work on, uh, you know, managing their addiction. Yeah. And I'm really coming from a place of, I just need to know the numbers. Yes. Um, so honest budgeting, round down when you're looking at your income, round up when you're talking about expenses so mm -hmm. that you leave yourself some wiggle room. So many people I know round up on the income because it sounds more fun. Inflated, and yeah. <laughs> and round down on the expenses because I don't spend that much. Just yeah. be honest. Let's yes. get into honest budgeting mm -hmm. so that you can really get a real sense of where you are. And the matter, the fact of the matter is, Great. I may not be in as good of a place that I had hoped, but at yeah. least I know where I'm realistically at. So then I can climb out of the hole that I've gotten myself in yes. or I can move to a new location. And so just really getting clear about where am I financially? What assets do I have? What's my debt? Will help me navigate a better financial future. Beautiful. Well said. Well said. Awesome. So Bob, how can the listeners connect with you to learn more about the great work you're doing. Um, maybe even set up a consultation or pick yeah. up a copy of the book and, and, and subscribe to your podcast, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, well, they can find me at the money nerve, money nerve.com. Okay. Um, that has information on the podcast money. You should ask where we talk Great. about money and emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk a lot about people's failures because I talk to a lot of successful people, but we want to like, that's the interesting stuff where, where we, uh, where we mess up. It's not a failure. It's a learning experience. Yes. Um, the podcast, there's free resources, there's blogs, um, information about my accounting practice, mm -hmm. my uh, financial therapy and coaching mm -hmm. is there. The book is there. Mm -hmm. um, TheMoneyNerve.com, it's a great place to find all of that. We love to connect with people and help people uh, find their financial way. Love it. Love it. Fantastic. So, Bob, I'm going to make sure that we have links to your website, uh, links to get your book, which I'm sure is on the website as well as the uh, link to subscribe to your podcast in the episode show notes. So the listeners can click on those links, subscribe to your podcast, pick up a copy of the book while they're listening to this awesome conversation. So <laughs> Bob, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I want to really, really thank you for coming on the show. Um, really appreciate it. You shared some great insights um, with uh, with the listeners and 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 I've learned some things. So, um, you know, personally, as not just a listener, but as um, as as someone to have a financial conversation with, I want to thank you for sharing uh, your 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 insights. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And I, I hope everybody out there. Uh, gets really conscious and intentional and, and picks themselves up no matter where you are, you can, you can move it forward. So I, I really Absolutely. hope people do that. Absolutely. Yes, you can move it forward. It's never too late. You've heard it right here, listeners, no matter how deep you think you are in and you don't think you can get out, you certainly can. There is always a way. So I want to thank you all for tuning in and listening to this excellent conversation with Bob Wheeler. And look, if you have a loved one or a colleague or, or a friend who seems to be in a very dark place, um, maybe they're going through some financial struggles, um, you know, maybe losing their home or um, maybe losing their job and, and, and have a family to support, you know, um, financial strains and struggles. Um, any type of uh, struggles they're going through, I humbly ask that you please share this show with them because on the road to rediscovery, we want our listeners to know two things. Number one, you're not alone. And number two, there's always hope. The road to rediscovery, it's a movement, a revolution. And guess what? You are now part of it. We're all roadies on this journey of life. And it sure feels good having you on the road with me. Thanks again for listening. We'll chat again soon. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of The Road to Rediscovery. We'd love to hear from you. Shoot us an email at roadsrediscoverypodcast at gmail.com and leave us any questions or comments you may have. The Road to Rediscovery is an AJ Shark production.